In the headlines, a 15% salary increase among police welfare association proposals ahead of fresh negotiations with the government. Households in various communities go days without pipe on water following a landslide at Springfield intake. And after 15 years as chairman, Simeon Albert says he will not contest Monday's urban council elections. I am Andrea Lee with the Channel 5 News details after this. Thank you for staying with us. First up, the Police Welfare Association is requesting a 15% salary increase for police officers. More from Idona John Baptist. As this year's round of salary negotiations with government is due soon, police officers met recently to decide on what their proposal will be. Apart from a 15% salary increase proposal, the membership of the Police Welfare Association wants several other benefits, including an increase in their outstation allowance and a risk allowance for all police officers. Chairman of the association, Constable Jefferson Drago, says he thinks their request is reasonable. Our proposal is 15% for the triennium, 2015-2018, um, 5% for each year. Police officers are tremendously stretched um, and going out of their way. And the powers that be are still asking for the police officers to be even further stretched. So in light of that, we are asking for an overtime allowance. We are also asking for the risk allowance. Now, this risk allowance is granted to certain sections in, within the police force. Now, we are asking government to give this risk allowance wrong the board to every police officer. With respect to the risk allowance, he says this is not the first time they've made a request for an increase. What has been paid presently to the other sections that get it is $450. Okay. So we are requesting that for every police officer. Because you will understand when um, the risk is involved, they do not call the, the police officers that are specially trained. They call every police officer is involved. You will understand when the, 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 during the Erica issue, every police officer. They call any police officer. With the Salisbury issue, every police officer. So the risk is there. Drago says their formal submissions will be made to government by next Wednesday. Things are getting more expensive and so we need a little more income so our dollar can stretch. It's negotiations, that's what they call it, right? We are going to the table for salary negotiations, right? So we are willing to, to bend whenever, wherever, however. That is what we are looking for. In more news now, evidence of a landslide due to the recent heavy rainfall has left some communities without water for a few days now. The landslide was discovered on Sunday and compromised the Springfield intake. And because the river was still swollen and um, there was high turbidity, we were unable to do much to restore water on Sunday. And then on Monday, the showers persisted, and it also impeded our effort. But um, we had to use some heavy equipment to help to clear the, um, the debris up at the intake. And our crews worked assiduously to help to restore water um, back to the community. So far, water has been restored to several communities along the West Coast between uh, Catholic Comfort and um, Mill, and so several communities were able to um, see a restoration of water last night. Um, throughout the course of today, Wednesday, um, we are continuing that effort. A number of the higher elevations would um, be, you know, getting water sometime later throughout the course of today, um, because we had to fill up the storage tanks to ensure that um, they, they could distribute water again. So we're continuing to, to um, work very, very hard to ensure 
by the communities to have water. Regis made an appeal to the public to store water, particularly during the hurricane season. The Piero says every effort is being made to restore water in areas affected such as Eggleston, Girardel and Upper Kingsville. On to local politics, where Simeon Albert is ending a 15-year stint as chairman of the Canefield Urban Council as the candidates prepare for Monday's elections. Albert told Channel 5 News he will not be recontesting the local government election, neither is he interested in being renominated as head of the council. When I became chairman of the council 15 years ago, uh, the council was at a stage where you couldn't get more than five persons within the community of Kenfield to nominate themselves to the council and therefore um, it was very difficult to attract the numbers that were required to serve. I did remain on the council for um, five consecutive terms and in more previously in my last three terms I have noticed that a number of residents are now showing interest in wanting to serve on the council. And so having served for 15 years as chairman of the council, I think there comes a time when you have to allow for new ideas to come on board. On top of that, Albert says he would like to concentrate on his own business and other activities. To the suggestion that this is a strategy and Albert is not serious about bowing out of the council, this is what he had to say. I made a decision to move on and I have no intention of coming if they would mean that I intend on coming in via the back door. But clearly my decision to move on is to move on. I do not intend to continue to serve on, on any form of being nominated. So if that is their idea, then they better change their mind. I just think after 15 years of what I consider voluntary services, because it is voluntary services, not something where you get paid. You know, you get a little stipend of 119.50, but you can consider that a salary. So after 15 years of volunteering my services, I think if I can, many of us in the community can volunteer 15 years of our time to the community, I think Kenfield will be a much better place. I will use my influence where necessary to continue to assist and to facilitate the residents as much as possible. In other news, the Goodwill Primary School will soon have a new face as the British government continues to prove its commitment to the region. On Monday, Royal Fleet Auxiliary Wave Knight arrived on Rose's Shores for a three-day visit where members of the crew will assist with the school's maintenance and paint job. This is a year-round commitment by the British government to the region in support of humanitarian aid and disaster relief and counter-narcotics operations. During the visit, Commanding Officer Captain Nigel Budd will pay courtesy calls on the President, His Excellency Charles Savre, and the Prime Minister, Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt. The visit of the Wave Knight marks one year since Tropical Storm Erica, when sister ship RFA Lime Bay was able to offer extensive humanitarian assistance in the aftermath of the tropical storm. By the first quarter of 2017, Dominica will be home to a fully outfitted disaster reconstruction center. Here is Kenny Williams with more. The Disaster Reconstruction Center was officially launched on 1st April this year by Dominica's then International Disaster Relief Coordinator, Baroness Patricia Scotland. Upon completion, the Disaster Reconstruction Center will provide information on reconstruction, resettlement, social services, and the private sector for visiting missions and the public, as well as media updates on reconstruction. An official with government's Disaster Reconstruction Committee says talks with foreign agencies are ongoing to ensure the safe and Innovation of the Disaster Reconstruction Center. I can tell you just um, last week, uh, all up to the weekend actually, the, the, the president and founder of one of the agencies, the agency working in government, which will be doing most of the major funding of the project, which is um, Six Capital, was an island with uh, the delegation. Um, we met with a number of stakeholders during last week just to tell you how alive and, and ready it is. So we, as you realize, we're going to have to undertake the restoration of a historical icon. Um, you, you have to pay very close and careful attention to what is there and how you're going to go forward in undertaking the necessary work that has to be done. Within six months, Dominicans can expect to see the full restoration of the former Queen Victoria Memorial Building, now Disaster Reconstruction Center. We are almost at the tendering stage right now, where we will have the, uh, the persons come in. 
and the plan that is there is within the next six months or so we would expect to see the full um, restoration of, 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 the, of, of the site. Um, then would come the actual equipping of the site because um, and the, the, the full re restoration will entail the building itself and also the, the, the surrounding of the building. You would, you would see from the Victoria Memorial building going back to the existing library, there's a walkway or pathway between the two buildings which you, ha you had this monumental um, water fountain and, and features within the center of it. Um, so the entire walkway and pathway has to be restored the, the water theme that was there will be restored with, with, with a bit of landscaping to en, you know, enhance the entire area. Um, so that is where we are at this point. Blackmore says planning is key in ensuring that the Disaster Reconstruction Center meets international standards. Before you can undertake the physical works on this thing, it calls for a lot of careful planning, review and consideration. And in fact, the easiest part of the work is the actual physical work in itself. Um, because you really want to make sure that you're, you're, you're well planned, you're well organized, and your focus and intervention is, is well intentioned when, when you're doing the work of this nature. Uh, and so this is what it is. This is what it is. It, it has to, as I said, it's not only something that we had to deal with locally, but you had international um, agencies and other persons involved who had to collaborate and so on this matter. The Disaster Reconstruction Center will also serve as a tourist attraction and provide historical information on Victoria Street. Kenny Williams, Channel 5 News. Coming up, a forest officer tells us about the difficulties of making sure the Cicero Parrot population is maintained. Welcome back. The Czech Hall River continues to be a threat to residents in the area as heavy rains Monday night posed a problem there. Government has had to resume a dredging project this week as a result. The rising river has caused more edge failure on the road or route to Czech Hall. The structure of a damaged house continues to be an obstruction on that road since Tropical Storm Erica last year August. Dominica's national bird is facing an uphill battle to stay alive as local conservationists try their best to revive that population. The Imperial Amazon or Cicero parrot is currently an endangered species as its population is dangerously low with just over 300 birds in the wild. Forest officer with the Forestry Division says there have been renewed levels of illegal activity which further threaten the population of the Cicero parrot. In some areas in, in, in the forest, we are seeing um, tracts of forest is being removed for certain activities in the forest, and that is impacting on, on the, the population in some of those areas, um, both in the forest reserve and in national parks, which is not very good. We are at a point now where we're getting stories, uh, or we're getting information, rather, on certain persons from outside, what, well, not wanting, but they have already um, established links with local people on island and they are helping them to look for eggs and birds in the wild. We are very, very concerned. After all those years, you know, I mean, we had control on, on those activities. Why some of us are, you know, that is the way that we think we can make money. Dira says a red-necked Amazon parrot, what we call the jackal parrot, while also labeled as a specially protected bird, provides high competition for the Cicero parrot. There are currently over 2,000 red-necked parrots in the wild. They are also challenged with um, competition from its sister species, the rednecks. Yeah, in terms of um, available nest trees, cavities and so on. So they're fighting for available nest cavities they can be found at lower elevation. Actually, I've seen parrots flying over the sea in recent times. Whereas you'll never see um, the redneck parrots flying over the sea. You would not see that for the imperial because it's a more, um, um, yeah, it's, it's a bird that you will find at high elevation. And the rednecks will tolerate human activity. 
you know, um, even in areas where there are, um, for example, in some persons holding a garden or something, and there's a tree that is available with a, ne a cavity, they would use it to nest. The imperial will not do that. The rednecks are aggressive. They are very aggressive. They will challenge the imperials for an available nest. The forest officer says he is happy with the changes on the cards regarding penalties for those caught with especially protected birds. Currently, um, what it is is $5,000 if you're caught with um, a parrot or parrot feathers or parts of a parrot, whatever. It's $5,000 EC or three years imprisonment. Cabinet recently um, approved new fines, but it's what? four years now and that, that still has not been um, um, it has not been passed in parliament. These are better figures in there, better fines, but again we're still waiting. Can you recall the figure of the um, I think it's ten thousand for replacing the five thousand. Okay. And there's also if you are caught exporting, you know, or attempting to export it's 25,000. In order for the Cicero parrot to no longer be considered an endangered species, its population in the wild needs to be boosted to over 1,000. And owner of the Bay Dominica Supercenter, Edith Walter, is trying to persuade Dominica's young people that locally made products are as good as products made overseas. Since the center's relocation, business has slowed down and the clientele reduced. Walter believes the support of the youth is needed now more than ever. From the time I'm here, the public support is getting there. It's not where it's supposed to be, where the awareness should be 100%, but it's getting there because um, we have to get through to the younger persons because they think that everything that is made in Dominica is not good because it's not from overseas. And everything from overseas is um, better than what we produce here. But they have to realize now that we are overseas too. Because somebody from St. Lucia coming to Dominica, they're coming overseas. So we have to appreciate what we have, what we produce, because it's healthier. Walter has reminded the public that supporting local is one way of securing local jobs. What we have to be conscious of right now is if we use the local products, we purchase the local products, we'll be securing more persons' jobs. Like um, if we, the more we import, the more foreign exchange goes out, the more we support local, the more the money revenue stays right here. So they might be securing my job, might be securing somebody else's job. So we are trying to encourage persons to um, use local, go local, buy local. That's news. Your sports highlights next with Kenny Williams. In cricket. Pakistan defeated England by nine wickets in their T20 match on Wednesday. Pakistan held England to a low total of 135 for seven, with no English batsman topping Alex Hills's 37. Set 136 to win, Pakistan replied with 135 for one in 14.4 overs. Next up, Goodwill Sports and Development Committee member Niger Hillier says phase one of Lindo Park's renovation is almost complete and he is looking forward to having the project completed by the end of the year. The Australian and New Zealand High Commissions are two major sponsors behind the project. Um, right now we're actually finished with the first sta stage of the jogging track where we have laid the, the main foundation for the jogging track, as you can see. Um, the lighting is on the way right now with Domlek have already installed the poles to sometime this week or early next week where the lights will be available for the field. Um, right now, after that, we'll be moving into the fencing um, aspect of the project um, where we're going to have the whole field fenced. And basically, those three phases are the phases that the old committee, when this project was passed down to the new committee, um, that the funds was allocated for. So the jogging track, the fencing and the lighting, the jogging track and the lighting of the field was um, donated by the Australian High Commission 
and the fencing was donated by the New Zealand High Commission. A major setback to the project's completion was that it was under budgeted. It was a project that was delayed for about two years. Um, in the process of that delay, of course, there was a budget that was set forth for this project, um, which was under budget from, it was under budget in the way that the old committee was taking on a lot of the labor costs. And um, with the new committee where we are not skilled um, contractors or carpenters in that sense that we had to hire contractors to do uh, most of the job that we do. Under budget, the jogging track was actually under budget by about 60000 um, In completing this jogging track, um, of course, we had, to con we had to complete it before the ending of September due to the, the policies or rules that was given to us from the Australian High Commission. And once again, um, the, new com the, the new committee took on this project and if we did not use the funds that was allocated for the project, we would have to return it. And also would have to return it with money that was already spent in starting the project that we did not have. We're visiting the cricket scene now where we take a look at the proposed two-tier idea for Test Cricket which suggests having the top seven ranked sides in the first tier and the lower three in the second level along with Afghanistan and Ireland. The benefits include giving each Test Series a context greater than just the bilateral trophy where they would be encouraged to strive for the best possible result to better their standing in the tier. Increased opportunity for associates to play long-term cricket and become more competitive and improve competitiveness in tests with closer matched teams playing each other making the competition more interesting for the fans. On the flip side however the proposed two-tier system could see the widening of the gulf between the top and bottom sides reducing the lower tiered teams chances of improving their cricket by not playing higher ranked teams. A concern that the rich would become richer and the poor poorer. Without top tiered India, England and Australia playing the lower ranked teams, it is possible that those boards would suffer financially. And since the top tiered teams were meant to be obliged to play the bottom tiered teams occasionally, there could be a danger of irregular contests and the possibility of distorted records. Meantime, sports consultant Joseph Thomas says the two tier system would work against the West Indies. The two tier system is I think a joke. I, I don't know. All of a sudden, when the West Indies, the West Indies always seem to find themselves at the raw end of the stick. When it is we had Ramadan and Valentine and Garfield Sober spinning fellas out of their out of out of their tunes, you know, in the sixties, now the West Indies have fallen back. What happens? You know, we want to have a two tier system. Right? And the West Indies find themselves in the bottom of the tier, and as a result of that, less interest will develop in test cricket when that happens. So, you know, we always find ourselves at the raw end of the stick, and um, it's rather unfortunate that um, these so-called friends of West Indies cricket, when they wanted their cricket to develop, they turned to the West Indies. Moving on to basketball, we are following a power outage in the Goodwill and Massac areas. The games scheduled for Tuesday were unable to be played. However, the 2016 Flow DABA League continues this week, all being well. On Thursday, 77 SC Lady Ballers will take on Lady Panthers at Lindo Park. That game begins at 7 p.m. Finally, in results from the Soka Dominate 300 Domino League, in Game 1, Riders 88 dose 3 points, Purple City 75 dose 2 points, and Galba Boys 61 dose 1 point. In the second game, Martian 81 dose 3 points, Execute 75 dose 2 points, and T Copa Wazon 64 dose 1 point. Finally, in Game 3, Arms 76 dose 3 points, Maho 72 dose 2 points, and Lilia Punishers 65 dose 1 point. That's all the time for sports. I am Kenny Williams. Be sure to join us tomorrow. And now your weekly flashback segment sponsored by a $3 plus mega store. 
three dollar plus mega store for all your stationary kitchen and bathroom supplies hardware and gardening needs including toys party beach and travel supplies visit three dollar plus mega store at the pedro investment building on the corner of independence and great marlboro streets home decor and fragrances also in store open mondays to saturdays 8 a.m to 5 p.m telephone number is 449-9951 Welcome to another interesting segment of Flashback, where we take you way back into our news archives at Mapping 2K4. This is indeed an interesting story from the past, with many faces of talented individuals from right here in Dominica. Our story takes us back to 1998, when ballroom dancers got their chance to shine through a prestigious event at the Garraway Hotel. An event which was obvious in its message that ballroom dancing was here to stay and the intent to teach the art as per international standards too. The students of a ballroom dance course held here last week were stepping out on Saturday night at their graduation ball. The course and the ball were organised by the Ballroom Dance Society, founded by Roosevelt Richards. He spoke of the decline of the dance form here over the years and his organisation's bid to stop the current gap. He admitted the long absence from the dance caused some of the students a few problems. We had learned 20-25 years of wrong dancing, wrong steps, wrong movement. We moved very nice, everybody liked us, we got applause for it. Marcia Gill of Trinidad and Barbadian Stephen Griffith both taught free of charge to help build the fledgling association. Mr Griffith hopes that one day Dominica will join the growing family of Caribbean ballroom dancers. Did I touch your hand? The Society's patron, Sir Clarence Signoret, officially opened the dance. He said that he's never been known as a dancer, but was glad to be the patron. The request, he said, brought back a pleasant memory from his days at Oxford in England when he went ballroom dancing there. As for ballroom dancing presently, as informed by a former ballroom dancer, the art form is still alive in Dominica. We are hoping that this form of dance can grace our stages more often to share a positive message on dance and its disciplines to our younger folk. You know, with all the twerking going on these days, a little finesse wouldn't hurt. I am Janik Delma Samuel. See you next week when we revisit our archives and bring you a piece of Dominica's history. Coming up, your weather forecast. Good evening, viewers. Welcome to tonight's weather broadcast. I am Janet Macpherson. A high-pressure system was the dominant feature today, resulting in generally fair weather conditions across the islands. Visible satellite imagery showed a few low-level clouds across Dominica today. Partly cloudy, two cloudy skies were observed. Radar imagery indicated scattered showers across the island chain. Tonight, a trough system is expected to result in an increase in cloudiness, scattered showers, and the chance of isolated thunderstorms. Persons in areas prone to flooding, landslides, and falling rocks are advised to be vigilant and to exercise a caution. By tomorrow, an improvement in conditions is expected, resulting in fair to partly cloudy skies, hazy conditions, and a few brief scattered showers. Seas tomorrow, slight to moderate, waves 1 to 1.5 meters or 3 to 5 feet. Looking ahead for the next three days, tomorrow, fair to partly cloudy skies, hazy conditions and a few brief scattered showers are expected. By Friday, an increase in cloudiness, scattered showers and possible isolated thunderstorms are expected due to the passage of a tropical wave. By Saturday, an improvement in conditions will result in fair to partly cloudy skies, occasionally breezy conditions with a few brief scattered showers. Throughout the Caribbean tomorrow, 
thunderstorm activity across the southern portion of the islands, partly cloudy skies across the central portion of the island chain, while cloudy skies and showers is expected across the northern islands. On the International City's forecast, thunderstorm activity is expected in Miami and Caracas, partly cloudy skies in London and New York, while clear skies is expected in Beijing. Sunrise tomorrow at 5.53 a.m. and sunset at 6.12 p.m. We are in the hurricane season, so please keep up to date with weather information by visiting our website at weather.gov.dm or calling the weather hotline at 447-5555. Thank you for viewing and have a good night. To end the news, the headlines again. A 15% salary increase among police welfare association proposals ahead of fresh negotiations with government. Households in various communities go days without pipe-borne water following a landslide at Springfield intake. And after 15 years as chairman, Simeon Albert says he will not contest Monday's Urban Council elections. Feel free to contact us at news at marpin2k4.com. You can also access our past newscasts on our YouTube channel. On behalf of the entire production team, I am Andrea Louis. And to all our viewers around the world, thank you for watching. Join us next time.